So I think we're joined here all together to enjoy this uh, Arctic Circle Conference. I think it's getting better and better all the years. And there's another thing I think we all share in common, is the gratitude to Iceland to organize this conference. So for me, it's a, a great pleasure indeed to introduce our next speaker, a representative of re the Republic of Iceland. It's Foreign Minister Lilia Dögg Alfredsdottir. Former President of Iceland, Mr. Ólafur Ragnar Grímsson, Ministers, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. Good morning to you all. It gives me a great pleasure to be here today at the opening of the fourth Arctic Circle Assembly. This gathering, initiated by Iceland's former president, has in few years become one of the world's most significant Arctic events, and certainly the one with the largest attendance. The increased interest in the assemble corresponds well with the augmented atten tension the Arctic as a region has gained at the international stage in recent years. By virtue of climate change and the subsequent debate of, on exploitation of natural resources, territorial claims, social changes, new shipping routes, and so forth, the Arctic cooperation gained momentum already 20 years ago. Then the eight Arctic states came together in Ottawa to establish the Arctic Council. This is a leading intergovernmental forum promoting cooperation and interaction with the Arctic states, indigenous communities, and other Arctic inhabitants on common interests and concerns, notably on matters related to sustainable development and environmental protection in the Arctic. On the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the Arctic Council last month, myself and my fellow foreign ministers from the seven other Arctic states issued a joint statement where we underscored that the Arctic cooperation has come a long way, from studies and reports to the realization of programs and projects with important concrete outcomes. Together in our statement, we also recognize the need for urgent global action based on the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement, bearing in mind the rapid impacts of climate change in the Arctic. Furthermore, our work aims to improve the well-being of the Arctic residents, protect the Arctic environment, and, prom and promote sustainable development throughout the region. This includes maintaining cultural heritage and the livelihood of the Arctic indigenous peoples. It is certainly not a daily event that foreign ministers of the United States, Russia, Canada, and the five Nordic countries collectively publish a statement on, the international, on an international matter. But it clearly demonstrates that we all highly value the Arctic cooperation and it bears witness to the successful multilateral collaboration and our sincere intention to strengthen our cooperation as new challenges and opportunities arise. It is no coincidence that we have on, on this occasion chosen to focus particularly on the consequences, of, uh, consequences and challenges that climate change constitutes for the Arctic region and its communities. As a result of global warming, we have witnessed considerable changes in the Arctic during the recent years. And these changes have been much more rapid than anticipated. Moreover, these changes are multifaced and affect our societies in numerous ways, economically, socially, environmentally, culturally, and in terms of security. It is therefore urgent that we take action to mitigate the negative consequences of climate change, and these pressing issues are evidently high on the Arctic Council's agenda. Likewise, the international community has been successful in setting goals and rules to address climate change and mapping out 
and mapping out the course to sustainable development, which is universal, leaves no one behind and preserves our planet. The rules and objectives are agreed, which in itself is a major achievement. Here I am, of course, referring to the 2030 Agenda for the Sustainable Development, which was adopted at the UN Sustainable Development Summit last year. I mention this here as we, tomorrow, have the honor welcoming the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, in Reykjavik. The Secretary General has been one of the most prominent instigators of the UN settings of the UN settings, the development goals, and his personal commitment to fight climate change was a key factor in reaching the Paris Agreement, which Iceland is proud to have ratified. Ladies and gentlemen, 20 years ago, the Arctic was not particularly high on the international agenda. The focus was exclusively on environmental protection and sustainable development. And even if this emphasis is still the backbone of the Arctic, Arctic Council's work, the cooperation within the Council has, in the course of the 20 years, become much broader and deeper. The role of the country that holds a rotating chairmanship of the Arctic Council has also increased. The current US chairmanship has been very successful with its emphasis on the ocean, climate, and communities, issues are issues that are of utmost significance to the Arctic setting. I am very pleased that Admiral Rob Papp, who has served as special representative of the US administrations for the Arctic, has been able to come to Iceland, and not for the first time, to convey the message of his administration of the future of the Arctic. Iceland will assume the chairmanship in two and a half years, and we will shortly start our preparations for that challenging assignment. Quite recently, the government of Iceland published a report on Iceland's interests in the Arctic, a project of a three-year work carried out by the Committee of Minister of Arctic Affairs. The report will, no doubt, prove useful as, as we start designing our chairmanship priorities and program. Iceland will follow Finland as a chair country, which again receives the torch from the United States next spring. It is therefore a privilege that uh, Finland's foreign minister attends this year's Arctic Circle Assembly, providing an overview of his country's priorities for the Arctic cooperation for the next two years. I, ver I very much welcome Minister Suni, a good friend here in Reykjavik. Yesterday we enjoyed a bilateral program together and uh, there was always also some football involved. I'm not gonna go into that here because we wanna be very uh, pleasant to uh, the visitors that we have. So <clears throat> anyway, but it was a really, really good uh, last night. Uh, needless to say, Iceland will work actively and closely with Finland on our Arctic agenda. But the Arctic is not exclusively the prerogative of the Arctic states and its people. We have seen more and more non-Arctic states and various organizations join the Arctic councils as observers in recent years. The Arctic discourse notions such as sub-Arctic states and near-Arctic states have become frequent. Iceland has always placed strong emphasis on the importance of the role of observers and we welcome the engagement of stakeholders that can contribute meaningfully to the Arctic cooperation. It will therefore be interesting to hear Scotland's First Minister speak later this morning about her vision for the Arctic and Scotland's interest in the region's development. I said earlier that the Arctic Circle Assembly has become one of the most important Arctic events worldwide. But this example is not solely limited to the venue here in Reykjavik, because it has reached out to other countries and parts of the world under the title Arctic Circle Forum. The next one in that row will be held in Quebec City in Canada in December. Thus, it's not only appropriate that the Premier, Premier of Quebec has come to Iceland to attend this assembly this fall. I'm sure it's a good warming up for the forum in his province later this year. Ladies and gentlemen, I've already emphasized the importance of the cooperation in the Arctic, and I'm confident that the Arctic Council will be successful in its work. 
but in spite of the Arctic Council's many achievements, there are flashing warning lights. Everywhere we are witnessing the consequences of climate change, but its impact is particularly revealing and drastic in the Arctic. Temperatures in the Arctic are increasing at more than twice the average global rate. The fragile ecosystem of the region is increasingly at risk, and the Arctic communities are experiencing firsthand the challenges of dealing with rapidly changing climate. And the consequences are far reaching, and there are repercussions around the world. These changing circumstances are likely to increase the Arctic Council's political weight. We see that the Council now addresses issues related to the environment and the communities in the region, such as response to en environmental threats, navigation, search and rescue, gender equality, cultural cooperation, health, and the state of animal and plant species, marine cooperation, etc. Et Iceland is among the countries that wants to increase the Arctic Council's weight and relevance in decisions on the region were necessary. The agreement on search and rescue, which extends to the, to the privilege to the um, whole Arctic region, was the first legally binding international agreement negotiated under the auspices of the Arctic Council. It has certainly served as a precedent for concluding further agreements in the other, other issue areas, such as the one on oil spill prevention, we are now aiming at signing the third legally binding agreement on scientific cooperation at the next ministerial meeting in 2017. These are good examples of increased leverage at the Arctic Council. They demonstrate that the Council has emerged as a political body, body that has a degree of influence and functions at a platform for debating Arctic key issues as well as a forum for building consensus and forging new agreements. I want to see this develop, development continue. I want the Arctic region to remain as a region of peace, stability, and cooperation. These values, however, are not self-evident. We have to make a huge effort to ensure, that, uh, to ensure a future where these values are still li lived up to. Iceland will continue to engage in this work and collaboration on Arctic issues whenever and wherever possible. A prosperous future for our magnificent Arctic can best be secured through inclusive and many-sided cooperation at the regional, national and international levels. And let's keep in mind that the future is not a distant vision, the future is now. Thank you very much for your attention.